Thank you, everyone. It's so nice to be here and talk to you. As I just said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some allocation settings with so some kind of different constraints, so priority constraints and also quota constraints. And this is joint work I've been doing with my advisor, Sid Banerjee, and also our other collaborator, David Kempe. So I guess as a motivating example for this, something we're really kind of all familiar with, unfortunately, these days is pandemic responses. And so kind of difficulties that come about from these settings, there's supply chain considerations, and it really places constraints on the medical resources that we have available to treat people with. And so we've had many kind of iterations of this as we go through the pandemic, starting with the ventilator problem kind of at the beginning, moving toward the problem of distributing out vaccines and kind of now this antiviral treatment problem. And there's kind of differing philosophies, different ideas of who we should be prioritizing. Right? So some of the communities think we should prioritize healthcare and essential workers, right? So these are the people that are directly responding and so we should give them priority. Other people say we need to provide priority to the people who are most vulnerable, individuals with comorbidities, and maybe also residents of higher density housing like nursing homes or university campuses. And so kind of we have these multiple different considerations we want to we want to respond to. And the big question is like, what's the best way to allocate care in a way that can address all of these somehow simultaneously? And kind of reviews of work in the space show that most of our pre-existing systems we had to do to solve this allocation problem are one dimensional. Either they like do a strict hierarchy of these considerations. So maybe first and foremost, I look at just people's just people's like medical considerations. And then to break ties, I kind of go one tier down and then start looking at occupations. Otherwise, there's also a setting where maybe I have a score for each of these and maybe do some sort of weighted linear sum to kind of come up with a number and use that to do the allocation. And these can have like pretty big problems, right? So if I have one, category, one criterion that kind of supersedes all the others, it could become like effectively impossible for people with certain traits to ever receive care, which is something like that's like pretty alarming to me, something we definitely want to avoid. It should not be impossible for someone to get medical treatment. And so kind of the response to this is to set up something called a reserve allocation setting, where we want to kind of think about distributing the care in a two-stage approach, where first I take all of the units available, pass them off to categories, which kind of personify these considerations, and then let the categories then further pass things along to the individuals based on like their own criteria. So maybe I set aside some of the medical units to these people based on employment, and I set aside others for like nursing home residents specifically. So kind of to formalize the setting, we have our agents, right? These are the people who need care. And we assume that each of them have a unit demand for the resource, they only need one. And they're also indifferent about where they get it from. So maybe they're members of multiple populations. And as long as they get the resource, they're happy. Like this can maybe be a little concerning in some other settings. Like I think medical care, like yes, people just want the medical care, but maybe in something like education where different scholarships or different ways of being admitted can like kind of have stigma or things attached. Like it might be more, more consequential there. Then we also have categories or these are the ways that people get allocated. And to each category, it like has some information about which individuals they would like to give to. So first it has its quota of how many units it's allowed to assign out. And then it can say which agents are eligible to receive an allocation in that quota. And then kind of a more fine grade measurement is priority. So who does it want to allocate to? And it does this with a pre-order. So it just kind of places all the individuals into ranked tiers where it most wants to give to people at the top kind of working your way down. And so the picture would be something like this T-chart, right? Where each column is one of these categories. The eligible people are ranked down it. Kind of as we work our way from top to bottom, we go lower in priority. And kind of the numbers at the top are encoding this quota, how many units each particular column can pass out. And so our goal is to decide on an allocation. So this is a map from the set of agents over to the set of categories. 
to saying where is each person allocated. And we also have the outside option. So some people, if we have a scarcity of resources, some people unfortunately can't be allocated. And we want to ask what are the properties that we should be looking for in this allocation map? And like pretty much the first few are all pretty self-evident from just the way we've set up the problem. So first there's this respect for quotas. A category shouldn't be able to hand out more units than it was given. We have eligibility respecting. I should never make a category give a unit to someone it deems ineligible. And then oh, this one's like maybe the most important to read. So the priority respecting, which says according to each category's priority order, it should never allocate to someone lower in the category before everyone higher received an allocation. And the key point here is either an allocation through that category or through some other category where that person belongs. So, so let's visualize this and I'm gonna do this just by adding circles to the picture. Right, so here, like for example, C is circled in category betas column because C got allocated betas unit. So like eligibility kind of immediately in the picture, right? We're only showing the eligible agents. The quote is you can check just by comparing the number of circles. The priority, like it's almost impossible to see it directly. And so to aid with that, I'm gonna add these squares. And where the squares means this agent was allocated but somewhere else. So here I've got a square in column gamma, it's got a circle in column alpha. And now priorities just means that I never have an unmarked agent strictly above a circled agent because the unmarked ones are the ones that didn't get allocated anywhere. And so, so far the, the constraints that we put out are just that they're constraints, but they don't really tell us any sort of notion of the quality of the allocation. So we're gonna need one more kind of objective that we're shooting for, which will be kind of the familiar notion of Pareto efficiency. And the way we wanna do it is I wanna be Pareto efficient in how many allocations I'm making. And here, kind of the more nuanced idea is I never want there to be an alternate allocation that meets the previous rules that I stated but that can somehow allocate to a strict superset of agents. So there's never a way to swap people around so that I can fit another person into the allocation. Like hopefully a pretty natural thing to shoot for. And the big question is, well, are there efficient algorithms to find allocations that have these four properties? So kind of to take a step back to look at some other recent work in this space, so kind of starting off this most recent line of work was this paper by Pataka et al, who really looked at this, kind of surveyed the existing literature, the existing techniques, and kind of really posed this question in a lot of the properties that I've stated. And they suggest this variant of deferred acceptance of the Gale Shafley algorithm, wherein I already have my categories giving me priorities over who should be allocated, now just assign arbitrary priorities for the agents to the categories. And now I kind of have this two-sided matching framework that I can run on. And there we can get three of the properties, the first three, but this doesn't guarantee Pareto efficiency. And then a similar story, so a follow-up paper to that, David Delacritas suggested the simultaneous reserve algorithm, which is kind of a water filling style. You go from the top of the categories down and kind of allocate as you work your way down the list and kind of shuffle around in between when you hit the quotas of the categories. And this one also fails to be Pareto efficient. Kind of a third example is this paper by Assis and Brandall, which proposes this reverse rejection scheme where we kind of want to look and hypothesize whether I can not allocate to someone and still like pass out all my units. So you kind of do a scan through this one, they can show that it does give a maximal allocation, which turns out to be Pareto efficient. But this one requires us to solve order n max matching problems. So it's like a little bit inefficient. The approach that I'm ultimately going to show you is only going to require one matching problem. So we're just going to reduce it to a single matching. So to go into our algorithm, it's going to be based on an integer formulation, integer programming formulation for the problem. So kind of to set up the integer program, 
that's kind of a pretty familiar setting. I have an indicator variable indicating whether each agent is allocated in each of the categories. Right, I have constraints that enforce unit demand, right? So each agent gets one allocation, enforces the quotas, or each category can pass out at most its units. I could just zero out any of the variables where people are ineligible to get that constraint. And for Pareto efficiency, we can handle that in the objective, right? By just simply trying to maximize the total number of units that I'm passing out. So this gives us a nice integer program. And it's like particularly nice because it has this structure of a, a B matching problem, a budget and matching, which means that it has a lot of nice structural results. In particular, it's totally unimodular, meaning all of its all of its corner points are integral, which means that we can kind of solve it as a linear program. And moreover, this is just a matching problem. And so we can use a lot of the techniques from matching. So stuff like the hot pref carp algorithm, the Hungarian algorithm to solve this like very efficiently. But of course, the problem here is we've done nothing at all to address the priorities. They don't show up at all here. And so, so this is our issue here. This is a solution to the South here, right? It, it gives out all of the units. That's great. So it's definitely maximizing the objective. You can check it meets, through, it meets all of the LP constraints, the IP constraints, but it isn't, isn't respectful of the priorities right here. Category alpha gave to D while C remained unallocated. So this causes us a problem. How do we fix that? So I'll give us three suggestions for what we can do. The first one is, well, I mean, here it's not too hard to see what the correct thing to do is just move D's allocation upward in the priority. And so we could think about maybe running an iterative scheme afterwards to make these local corrections. And this will work. But you can construct examples where it kind of like cycles around and you can require order M N of these, which, which gives you an even slower algorithm than the one we're trying to compete against. The other thing we could try to do is add more constraints, right? All of these priorities are encodable as linear constraints in the variables we already have. But when we do that, we lose the nice matching structure that we have we lose the integrality of the corner points. And it's really not clear that there's an efficient way to solve the resulting integer program. So there's really only one more thing that I could think of that we could do, which is let's change the objective. So how do we do that? So to kind of give you a picture of what's going on, right? If I think about the linear programming version of this, right, I look at the objective and there's this kind of like large high dimensional face of optima to that linear objective. And some of them will be nice, some of them won't be nice. And well, what I wanna do is I wanna tilt away from the bad ones so that kind of the subface of optima that remain are all good ones. And so to do that, well, to tilt the objective, right, you just kind of perturb the coefficients a little bit. We're gonna use these deltas and well, what are the things we need in these deltas to get to a good solution? Well, first of all, I still want Pareto efficiency. And so if I kind of charge these costs to perturb it, I never want the cost to reduce the size of the allocation I'm going for. So I want the deltas to be like very small, just because I want the sum of all of them to be less than one half. So it never disincentivizes me passing out all of the units. And the second thing I want is, well, I want them to encode the priorities which means that if somebody has higher priority in a category, then this cost to allocate them there, this delta should be smaller. And these are the only criteria that we want. When we replace our previous objective with the perturbed objective V of delta, then we get a new integer program. And this one behaves nicely in that as long as the delta I choose to perturb with, satisfies the two properties on the previous slide, then all of the solutions to this, all the corner point solutions to the LP satisfy the four properties we want. And so we've reduced the problem to just solving one, in this case, weighted bipartite matching problem. So we kind of like give very high level insight into how the theorem works. It's honestly not too bad, but the two of the properties are just baked right into the constraints. The small effect of the delta ensures the Pareto efficiency, or sorry, ensures the, 
Ah, the, okay, the priorities are ensured by the consistency or just the thing we baked in. And Pareto efficiency is kind of this like little latticey argument of since the deltas are small, the amount that they can perturb the objective value by is less than an integer, which means that since I'm tracking the number of agents they're allocated to, if I reduce it by less than an integer, but I know it has to be an integer, it must have stayed the same. And so really adding the priority constraints in doesn't reduce the number of people I can allocate to. So now I wanna kind of shift and say, how can we use this to also start thinking about fairness? And I guess in fairness to you all, I think I'm, I'm not gonna go as deep as I would like to into this, but I'm happy to talk more about it later. But so kind of so far, what have I showed you? I've showed you that, well, we can choose any delta that meets these two kind of basic conditions, solve the integer program, and I get a good allocation. And the converse question to that is, if there's a specific good allocation I want to target, am I able to choose a delta that will realize that? So kind of the converse result we show is almost. This is almost true. There's one kind of caveat, which is we, we can't find allocations that have kind of this, where there's this kind of way that the categories can cyclically trade and all move up their lists. But, but barring this, we can find all of the remaining allocations. So the thought is, since we can find all of them, can I impose additional restrictions on delta, which ensure that the solutions I find have some other nice properties that I can look for? So kind of adding a secondary objective on top of just my Pareto efficiency. So kind of I put one example down here, which is, well, I can have different kind of scales of perturbations in different categories to enforce kind of priority to members in one group over the other. So I guess this is picking up the bad features of the previous examples, the previous one dimensional settings, but it's possible. Now let's talk a little bit about, about how we can use these deltas to find maybe some notion of fairness. Kind of the way I wanna think about fairness is in terms of auditability. If I have the result allocation from one of these schemes, how can I convince, how can I convince the members that I'm allocating to that my decision was fair? Like what information do I need to reveal to them for them to be satisfied that I did a good job in allocating? And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to publish kind of cutoffs in each of the categories, which is to say, I'm going to tell everyone what their rank was in each of the categories. And then I'll just tell them, like, where was the cutoff? Like, at what rank level was it so that everyone above the rank was allocated and everyone below wasn't? And just by revealing this, well, they can look at their own score in the categories. And that justifies to them whether or not they should have expected to receive an allocation. And so the two cutoffs we could think about are one is I can just publish the lowest down rank that someone got an allocation of in the category. This is kind of like the highest bar that I could set the cutoffs at. And the other extreme would be I could publish the highest rank of the person that was unallocated. And so basically any cutoff in between those would be something that I could publish that would satisfy everyone. So very quickly, let's talk about one thing we could do is we could think about what is the most priority respecting allocation that we could do. And so this is gonna be trying to minimize the ranks of the people who are allocated. So one thing we could do is just minimize the sum of their ranks. And this already, like if you squint at it, it's basically our objective already from P of delta, where delta is this rank. And so if I normalize it, then I can show that if my deltas are just kind of scaled versions of the rank, I plug it into the perturbation and exactly this delta, when I do the minimization, it, it will give me the thing that minimizes that sum. The second one is minimizing the maximum rank of any allocated individual. And here you just kind of play the same game, but you use geometrically set weights so that kind of pushing anyone down lower gets like a multiplicatively bad penalty as you go down. And so kind of to conclude, there's a lot of other ways that we can think about augmenting 
the, the problem to solve for other objectives. So things like we could think about how can we give agents what they're looking for? How can we like allow them to express utilities over where they want to be allocated in? And kind of a natural open question would be, is there some set of criterion that we can have on these allocations that identify maybe the unique best allocation? And so this is kind of an open question. There's maybe some subtle issues with this I'd be happy to talk about more later. And the last thing I want to leave you with is that this kind of idea of perturbing the LP and kind of thinking about the lattice on the, where the solutions lie, and like kind of adding in this secondary smaller perturbation seems like an interesting idea that I think would be applicable in a lot of related problems. Thank you so much. Thank you.